so yeah, my 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 thought and my passion was in games, and I also very much realized that I, I wanted to create my own games. So I started uh, Massive Entertainment in Ronneby in 1997, together with my co-founder Christian Perez, uh, who was never actively involved in the company, but helped on a strategic level and helped with financing and funding. He had studied at uh, the Stockholm School at Economics, so we had a financial background. I can also mention the, the original name for Massive was, well, the original, original name was Sparks, with an X at the end, sounded cool for a while. But then when we registered a company, we called it Nova Storm. Um, so we registered a company as Nova Storm, also sounded cool for a while, for about a week. And then I realized it sounded more like a neo-Nazi group or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it took about a year to figure out a better name. Uh, and in the end, I woke up one morning and just had sort of massive entertainment in my head. I said, okay, that's, that's what it's gonna be. So I don't know how much you guys know about Massive, but we started off uh, creating uh, a game called, initially called Genesis, um, but eventually re released as Ground Control in 2000. Has anyone played Ground Control? Yes, I like you guys. <laughs> anyone remember the name of the planet they were on? Krig, which in Swedish, <laughs> and Krig 7B. And I used to go to Schilbe <laughs> uh, in Then, I, this is a very summarized version of my years at Massive. But then we released Ground Control 2 in 2004, and eventually World in Conflict um, in 2007, and uh, World in Conflict Soviet Assault and Expansion Pack uh, in 2009. Um, during those years, we also created a bunch of other games, but the ground control and world conflict games were the big ones. We also, in, in 98, 99, we were asked by Ericsson to do a pre-study for games for mobile phones. And I should t tell you, Ericsson had an office in Ronneby, um, so we were still there. I, I knew some of their, their bosses, and I talked to them and said, you, you really need to have games in your phones. And they said, no way, Ericsson will never have games in our phones. We're, we're a serious company. Uh, two, two months later, Nokia came out with Snake. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the rest is history. <laughs> two hours after Snake became a huge hit, Ericsson called us up and said, hey, maybe you can do a pre-study for <laughs> games and mobile phones. So we developed a version of Tetris for Ericsson, which wasn't called Tetris, it was called Eritris just because Ericsson didn't want to pay the license fees to the Tetris owners. Uh, I shouldn't say this really, but, but uh, uh, in the end, I think they ended up paying the license holders a lot more money than they paid us to develop <laughs> Tetris for them. Uh, at Massive, we also created um, Drömjobbet in Roseman Valley, the dream job in Roseman Valley, which was basically a shopping mall simulator. So your, your job was to set up a shopping mall um, and create all the stores uh, and the um, interiors for the stores and uh, all the stuff that were, was, was to be sold, etc. Uh, quite a different game from, from what I had been playing before, uh, but also a very interesting experience. Massive today, uh, we moved Massive to Malmö in 2000. Massive has today about 400 employees. It was acquired, acquired in 2002 uh, by Vivendi Games. Um, so I, I was 28 years at the time, had been running the company for five years uh, as an, uh, basically as an indie, indie developer. And for me, it was extremely interesting to see, okay, being part of a huge publisher with thousands of employees, how, how, was, how, how would that experience turn out? So I had a great time between 2002 and 2009 when I left. In uh, 2008, Vivendi Games and Activision merged to become Activision Blizzard. And in that whole process, they decided to divest basically all their studios and assets outside of North America. Um, ah, no panic, I was told about this. This is the alar alarm. <laughs> oh, okay, that was quick. <laughs> no, okay, it's, uh, it will probably t go off again at around seven, so in, a, in about an hour, just so you know. Um, yeah, so Ubisoft acquired Massive in 2008. Um, back then I had been running the company for 12 years. Um, and uh, started thinking about m what would my future be. Before I go into that, uh, 
how many look forward to play the division? Come on. <laughs> You're better. Who did? You, or is it good? <laughs> oh, you can't say anything. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> uh oh. Okay, say no more. Um, as I mentioned, Ubisoft acquired Massive. Uh, and in that whole process, I had been running the company for 12 years. I had a great experience, but it wasn't my company anymore. When Activision Blizzard sold Massive to Ubisoft, it was clear that I was sort of me and the team. We were the object being sold. I wasn't really uh, asked uh, about my thoughts about being sold. Um, so that whole process sort of opened the uh, Pandora's box in, in my head. Um, did I want to stay on at Massive for another 12 years or and, uh, until I retired at some point, or did I want to do something else? So in the end, um, I had four months of big uh, decision anxiety. Um, but in the end, in early 2009, I said, OK, um, I'm leaving Massive, so what should I do instead? I got a great idea. <laughs> At Massive, it was all about creating the best games in the world. That's the sort of ambition, uh, the level of ambition at Massive. And, and basically, that's how my mind works. That um, whatever I put my mind to, I really want to create great things. Um, and even I know that trying to create the best things in the world is, is hard. <laughs> but it gives you so much energy. When you really try the best you can and really say, OK, we're in this small city in Sweden. Well, the third largest, but still a small city. Um, we can still compete with everyone else in the world and create the best things in the world. So how do you top that ambition? Well, with Panito, my current company, uh, the ambition is to create the biggest games in the world. So the best and biggest games in the world. Um, and what does that mean? Well, uh, I, I realize that creating PC and console games is not going to be the biggest games in the world. Um, so it was pretty clear that going into more social games and mobile games was the right move forward for me. And what we've created at Planito since we started is quiz games. Um, a lot of people think I'm, I'm crazy from going from big PC and console games um, with uh, teams of hun hundreds of people uh, into creating small quiz games with just a few people. Um, but for me, as a, as a producer of games, as a game designer of games, this challenge is at least as fun as those big games. Um, having the smaller creative box and be, being creative in this is extremely interesting and an extremely fun challenge on a daily basis. Uh, so my whole vision and thought about Planitio and quiz games is that there are not many game developers, a lot of game developers, aspiring game developers or, or who learn to program, create really simple quiz games and then they quickly move on to the cooler stuff. Um, so what I wanted to do in 2009 and still do is sort of move from the other direction, from the cooler stuff into what I think is extremely cool and extremely interesting. Um, our biggest success to date, we, we're still not the biggest game in the world, uh, we're working on that, uh, but our biggest success to date, uh, Quiz Battle has reached 4 million downloads uh, in the Nordics. Um, sp it was a huge success, especially in Denmark, uh, where basically a quarter, 25% of the entire population had downloaded the game uh, about a year ago. So still we're nowhere close to um, Candy Crush, but we're coming for them. Uh, as a small startup, uh, Planito, um, it's always been a challenge to to finance our games and sort of to f find funding for our uh, project. So in the end, now six years after starting, we um, realized that being part of a bigger group um, was the right move for us. So a couple of months ago, Bonnier, uh, which is a big uh, Nordic Swedish media. Uh, company acquired Planito, um, and now we're part of Bonnier, and they are fi financing and funding sort of our uh, expansion. Um, and we're continuing to create uh, quiz games and have some extremely interesting quiz games um, in sort of in the process of being developed. But we're just a small team; we're about four or five guys. Um, so the future for us uh, looks very interesting and very interesting. Uh, uh, and to me. Uh, with Bonnier, we can ha sort of have more resources, a bigger team to realize the vision we have with Planito. And now you've just re received two minutes about Planito, so I'm not going to say that much more. I, c I can say, though, 
that we're looking for Java programmers and Unity programmers. <laughs> um, you can email me, martin at planito.com or martin at wallfish.com if you are the right one for us. Um, quickly, if you read one book this year, how many of you read books regularly? Good. <laughs> how many of you can read? <laughs> it should be the same amount, all the hands. Um, read this book. If you're interested in the games industry, uh, read Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. It has it's not written about the games industry, it's written, Ed Catmull is one of the founders and the president of Pixar, um, but it really reads like a, like a game company. Uh, it, uh, obviously this is maybe in more applicable to the bigger companies, but even if you have a small company or work at a small company or, or, or are starting a small company, just understanding the creativity and the process that goes on at Pixar, which is very applicable to games, the games industry, uh, was a big eye-opener for me. There were so many things in here that I just said, yeah, this is exactly, exactly how it should be. All right, damn, I'm, I see I'm running out of time. We're gonna jump into, I promised you some um, stuff about gamification. Uh, any questions so far? Two reasons, um, well, three reasons. Uh, one, as I sort of alluded to, I, I have a tendency to be contrarian. So when people um, think that creating quiz games is this sort of easiest thing you can do as a game developer, I wanted to show that no, it's not. Uh, there, there is a lot of room into creating great quiz games. Um, and that sort of goes into the other reason, the second reason, is that um, I truly believe that uh, quiz games is about so much more, there is so much more gameplay than just about answering a question. Um, Trivial Pursuit back in the early 80s was such a huge hit and, and is still a hugely popular game. Um, and there have, hasn't really been any popular quiz games. Um, uh, how, how many of you have played Buzz on the PlayStation? A few, okay. So that was sort of, after Trivial Pursuit, came buzz 25 years later. And now we have Quiz Campen and Quiz Up and a few others on the mobile platforms. But we're still, to me, we're still just in the beginning of, um, of combining quiz and knowledge or games and knowledge into the into quiz. And then the third reason is that we also realized as we started the company that as people answer quiz questions, uh, we can quantify their knowledge. We can build knowledge profiles. Uh, we, we know what people are experts on, and we also know what they're not that good on. Um, I'm going to say straight away, we're not doing that in secret. Uh, that's an opt-in thing you can decide to do, and it's more a vision we have than something we're doing right now. But the whole idea is we've realized that if people can have their knowledge profiles, if people can see their friends, their Facebook's friends' knowledge profiles, in a way we can change the internet. We, ca we, can, we can transcend the games industry um, and come with a sort of a service and an offer that is, that is bigger than games and that makes people's life online better. Um, um, I, I, with gamification, um, I, I want to add, it's not about what Blizzard does. Uh, gamification to me, and, and I like this definition, is using game mechanics outside of the games industry. Um, and this is a word that, that was sort of popular and the buzzword five years ago, and then sort of people started talking about it, and then a few years ago, everyone in the games industry said, eh, gamification sucks, and, and the word has sort of received a bad reputation. But to me, it's very clear. Using w what we as game designers and game developers learn doing games, applying that to other areas, to me as an entrepreneur, is extremely interesting. And I think, w as game developers, we should get off our high horses and, and think that the only thing interesting doing in, in your life is creating games, pure entertainment games. Creating, using game design, using game mechanics, using game experiences in other areas will make life so much better for so many more people. Um, so I can really urge you that um, don't think about gamification as a bad thing. Uh, think about it as an extremely interesting challenge. Um, and as game developers, we should be able to look at any creative box and see it as a challenge and create good things with it. That should be our mindset, at, at least. 
you're not red in the face, so I, I take it you agree a little with me. Um, so gamification, uh, it's about getting the badges, it's about getting points, it's about using your Fitbit and the, I don't know what, I don't use it. Um, it's, you can gamify your car. Um, here's the one very interesting, how many here have kids? A few, okay, I have four. Um, so getting the kids, I haven't used this, I just found this online and t stole the screenshot, but um, sh chore wars, so basically getting the kids to do chores around the house and having fun while they do it, what a fantastic idea. <laughs> I haven't tried it. Um, the email game, this was interesting, I haven't tried this either, but uh, as a concept it's extremely interesting to sort of create a game wh where it's all about answering and sort of processing as many of your emails as, as quickly as possible. Uh, oh, you're number three Orville this week, you're 10 seconds per email, you spent 17 minutes, 23 seconds, blah, blah. It's uh, interesting take on gamification. Uh, Code Academy, learning, learning to program um, and, or learning other stuff. Um, that, that can also be gamified. Um, here is Playvox, which is a call center uh, uh, platform uh, which they have, have gamified. So for all those hundreds of minions who just call and call and call and call each day um, to, different, to sell different stuff or ask different questions, at least they have a little more fun <laughs> um, with this platform. So gamification, the use of game mechanics and rewards for non-game applications in order to increase engagement and loyalty. Um, but over the years, as I've been thinking about gamification and, and looking at that uh, sort of definition of gamification and, and thinking about how it's being applied, what struck me was that th talking about gamification, we need to understand what a game is. Um, and here I'm, I'm, I'm shortly going to come to and propose sort of my definition of what a game is. And I, I'm very, I very much, if we have time, want to have a discussion about it. Um, and get, get your points about it. But I, I started by looking at some definitions of games. Um, so if you look at Vic Wikipedia, uh, the, the article about a game has a number of different um, definitions. A game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. Okay. Sounds a little academic. Uh, a game is a fort of F form of art in which participants, termed players, <laughs> make decisions in order to manage resources through game tokens in the pursuit of a goal. Okay, I didn't understand much of that one. <laughs> um, when you strip away the genre differences and the technological complexities, all games share four defining traits. A goal, rules, a feedback system, and voluntary participation. That makes a little more sense, um, to me at least. Uh, but. Still, uh, over the years, I'm sort of struggling, okay, how do I, what is really a game? How should I, as a game designer, think about a game? Uh, and a few years ago, I came up with this uh, definition. Um, a game is a set of challenges with proportional rewards and meaningful progress. Um, and at least in my brain, uh, obviously these are my words, uh, this is a lot more clear <laughs> and a lot more easier to understand. Um, just as an example, if we apply this definition to Tetris, so first of all, every game needs to have a challenge. So the challenge in Tetris is to, um, yeah, you know. <laughs> What's the proportional rewards? Well, you get points, you get a score each time uh, you drop a brick, Tetris brick, what's it called? Block, a Tetris block. Uh, and another actual reward as you play is also that when you get a complete line, it disappears. So that's also part of the reward system. And then the meaningful progress is that you can level up. Um, and actually what happens when you level up is that uh, the blocks start falling faster. So in a way, the game design is, um, is hurting you or sort of <laughs> um, punishing you for being good at the game, which, is, um, which many games do, but we typically don't talk about it in that way. Another thing that is also meaningful progress uh, is that the score accumulates. Uh, if I would get 10 points each time I, I drop a block, but the 10 points would just disappear in thin air, 
uh, it wouldn't mean much to me. But as it accumulates, it gives me a sense of progress. I'm, I'm achieving something over time. So um, having sort of written down that definition uh, a while ago, I also started thinking, okay, what, what are the different challenges that we can see or d d use as game designers? What are sort of the artifacts, the building blocks? And, and looking at a number of games, and again, I've just done this in my spare time. I haven't done any real research. This, these are my personal theories. But a few sort of artifacts of, of challenges that popped into my head very quickly was sometimes you need to do something very f quickly. Uh, sometimes you need to learn a skill, sort of basically how to, how to use your gamepad or, or the other interfaces. Sometimes it's based on your actual knowledge you have in your brain, quiz games typically. Uh, search, sometimes you have to search for something in the game uh, as a challenge, something you need to use your intelligence. Puzzle games are typical of that. Um, some games, a challenge is to compete against other either human players or AI players. Sometimes it's about cooperating, sometimes it's about timing and coordination. Another artifact, create something, or sometimes, which you shouldn't um, dismiss as a very important uh, design factor is luck. Uh, luck is an extremely important thing when you, uh, ra random things and luck is an extremely important thing to use as you design your games in the right places. Um, those of you who have played Hearth Hearthstone, I don't know how to pronounce it, Hearthstone. Uh, it's a card game. Um, do, do all, does anyone know what Hearthstone is? Most of you, someone not know. Okay, it's, it's basically a card game. You play against one other opponent, um, you get cards and then, yeah, you basically kill each other. But the point is that you never know what your next card is going to be from the deck. That's random uh, luck component of that game, uh, which is a very central piece of the game. Sometimes you get exactly the card you want, and sometimes you get a, a card that might be good at some other point in the game, but is really bad right now. Another thing that I, I've, uh, I should have added here, what, which I also realized just a year ago, another component, which is a, a form of a challenge, is something I call a mindless task, mindlessness. Um, uh, basically, giving the player a challenge that doesn't require any thinking. Um, and the reason I started thinking about that was because I played a lot of Candy Crush. Um, and I realized that I played Candy Crush the same way as I, before then, basically sapped the TV. Sap the TV, is I call that sap in English? Okay, you know what I mean. Basically just switching channels and not really looking, but just sort of relaxing in the sofa. So th that's the way I played Candy Crush, and I realized that sort of every five game, uh, every five try in Candy Crush, I had, I was so lucky that uh, in the first few moves that I realized now I have a real chance to finish the, the game, uh, or finish that um, mission, or what do you call it? Um, map. You know what I mean. Um, so that's when I focused. But four out of five games, I was being completely mindless. I wasn't thinking what I was doing, just matching the three and not, not thinking at, a lot at all about it. So that's also an extremely interesting component, especially if you do games for a more casual social uh, audience. Letting people relax, letting people not having to focus, not having to think about what we're doing. For those of you who think that creating the best games you can is just about creating the next Call of Duty, you won't understand this. Uh, but for those of you who have a broader perspective, uh, you should really think about this. Running out of time. Um, examples of rewards. Uh, again, gamification. Many people think it's just about badges uh, or, uh, or it's about uh, getting points. But looking at rewards in games, there is so much more. Um, uh, we talked about this in, in Tetris. Basically, a reward in Tetris is that you increase the difficulty. And this is very common in games. Uh, because a part of the fun in games um, is that you learn a better skill, is that you think you're be you could become better at it. All right, another, this, this is not my, my graph, my slide. I stole it uh, proudly. Um, but it's so easy um, as well. When you think about game design, this is difficulty and this is time spent playing. And if it's too hard, 
too soon, it's just frustrating. If, if it's too easy for too long, it's just boring. So to find the game mechanics then, you need to keep this in mind. And this is individual um, for each player. So uh, an obvious thing is that as we design games, as we create games, uh, w this is maybe the only medium, um, because it's interactive, where we can change this curve depending on each individual player. So this is also an approach we need to think about when we create games. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, good. Uh, I'm going to jump over. I'm going to skip this one. Um, again, about gamification. Um, creating a game is all about the players having fun, or whatever adjective you want to put in this. Um, and then gamification has used in different business areas, different companies, for other reasons. They have other business goals. Um, and there are so many people who started dabbling in gamification who go in here and focus on this and forget that maybe you can do some stuff here, but, but if you're not delivering this, you're not creating a game. So I realize this is easy to say, a lot harder to do, but true gamification is when you get the, in, get the uh, goals to intersect um, between the business goals and, and the player fun. Okay, I'm al almost done. Uh, I love this slide. Reality, worst game ever. Um, that's also another aspect that business goals, game, gamification in the sense of using it in, in other companies, that is, games is all about escaping reality or many times, whereas businesses and, and have other interests. They are very much rooted in reality, typically. So, um, Gamification is sort of merging reality with the fun of games. Um, and you, you saw my definition previously of what a game is. I, I also realized uh, a while ago that you can basically say the same life is more or less the same thing. Life is a set of challenges, sometimes with re rewards um, and occasional progress. Um, so the difference between life <laughs> and, and a game is we have challenges, but a game makes sure that you have proportional rewards. So you always, for an easy challenge, you get a small reward. For a really hard challenge, you get a big reward. So you always, um, uh, yeah, you understand. And also in a game, you have meaningful progress. You always need to feel that you're moving in a direction that makes sense to you, that makes is, is fun to you. Typically learning something or making making you feel that you're better, or just as in Candy Crush, just increasing your levels and, and feeling good about that. Um, whereas life sometimes gives you rewards and occasional progress. 